Good morning, good morning, Rabotai. Welcome to the class without the breakfast. Uh, today is Ta'anit uh, Esther. And I wanted to speak a little bit about this holiday um, because it is, this Ta'anit, because it actually is a very strange uh, concept. It's a very unique uh, concept as well uh, in the world of Ta'aniyot, in the world of fasts. Today's uh, class is dedicated in honor of Rabbi Farhi for providing meaningful and entertaining Devar Torahs. Oh, thank you very much. That my husband and I enjoy listening to on WhatsApp. Also for the Rifuah Shilema of Shira Bat Devora, sponsored by Dori and Jay Haberman. Uh, today's spiritual breakfast is also, and class is dedicated in honor of Rivka and Eli Levy. May Hashem bless you with health, wealth, and happiness. We love you by the Chams, Levy, and Sutton families. Dedicated as well, in loving memory of Maurice Levy and Audrey Levy, Aleyma Shalom, Lilu Nishmatem Moshe Ben Sefia and Hannah Bat Rachel, sponsored by Aiki Levy and the family. Um, and inshallah as well, the class is donated anonymously. Okay. Rabotai, every one of the fasts seems to follow a very similar pattern. So let's look at all the other fasts that we know. What other fasts do you know of in the, in the, uh, in the calendar year? We have Tzom Gedaya, we have Asara B'Tevet, we have Shiva Asar B'Tamuz, we have Tisha B'Av, all of which, by the way, are mentioned by the Navi in the, in the Pasuk. Tzom Asiri, Tzom Ashivi'i, mentions each one of the Tzomot by their month. But first of all, Ta'anit Esther is not in there. There's no mention of Ta'anit Esther in, the, in that Pasuk. Number two, every one of those Ta'aniyot, what are they for? They're for an act, a catastrophic uh, act, something that happened to the Jewish people in occurrence that we're doing Teshuvah for even years later because the day had within it such devastating results. Then comes Ta'anit Esther. What in the world is going on here? Ta'anit Esther was not a bad story. It was a good story. In fact, in just tomorrow, what are we going to do? Right? We're going to have tonight ready. We're going to have Reed Megillah. We're going to celebrate. It's going to be mad party vibes. So you're going to go from this idea where you're having this whole fast. Fasting for what? Did nobody died. The goyim, the, the, the goyim that wanted the Jewish people dead, they were, uh, they were pushed back, they were defeated. Uh, and Mordechai got Haman hung on the tree. What's the fast for? Isn't this a fascinating question? The fast of, of Tanit Esther is very difficult to understand. In fact... If you try and track down the origin of the fast, it's also very hard. It's hard to find why we fast today. Now, I'm not discouraging anyone from fasting. <laughs> That's the halakha. It's brought down halakha. We have to fast. We have to fast. That became the halakha. But the question is, where did the halakha, where did the minhag come from? So, I wanted to just share uh, something that's very interesting. And I thought that this was... Very, very beautiful in, uh, in understanding maybe or gaining insight into the way our great rabbis understood uh, the process of thought that a person has to have when they think of the great things that happen to them in their life alongside the, you know, the most terrible. So I'm going to bring you something that's brought down in the name of Rabbeinu Tam. The Gemara and Megillah um, calls this day, the day of uh, Adar, it's a time of coming together, and Rashi says that this, you know, this describes this concept that everyone came together on this day, Nikalu uh, they gathered together against the enemies to fight back. So that's what this day, the 13th day of Adar is. Rabbeinu Tam, they say that that can't be. If that's the case, then it would have called it not a day of gathering of Keilah, of this, of uh, Kenisah, of bringing in, but rather they would have called it a day of Milchama. And since they did not call it a day of milchama, it doesn't mean that it was a day of war. Rather, what does it mean? It means that they all came together to pray, silichot, to hanunim, uh, and they fasted on this day. Now, how did they get the fact that they fasted? Now, this is fascinating, okay? We know that the day before a ta'ani, the day before a big war, the day of they would go to war, we have an understanding that Am Yisrael, the, the, the uh, soldiers, would fast on that day in order that their war should be blessed, that they should do Teshuvah as they go into this big battle, this big war, okay? And where do we see this concept? Because when Moshe Rabbeinu and 
Chur and Aharon went up to the mountaintop in the war against Amalek. So we know Moshe Rabbeinu lifted up his arms. Chur held up his arm on one side. Aharon held up his arm on the other side. And so long as Moshe's hands were raised, they won the war. If the hands went down, then the tide of the war shifted. It was dependent on his prayers and his supplications to Hashem at the top of the mountain. Okay? Now this is unbelievable. We took it for, for granted. Our Chachamim were so sure that they fasted on this day, when it doesn't say that, it doesn't tell us that they fasted, because it was the day that they went to war, that we learn a halakha with regards to fast days from Moshe Chur and Aaron. We learn that the Chazan, on a fast day, is supposed to have, he's supposed to be flanked by two people as he prays for a pub, on a public fast day. Those two people, where do we learn them from? From Chur and Aharon. Again, one more time. It does not say that they were fasting there. Our Chachamim understood they were fasting there because the general practice was that when they went to war, they fasted. One example of this, by the way, of when they went to war, they fasted when they went to war, was the story of Yonatan. If you remember that he tasted from the, from the honey, right? When they declared they're going to war, they declared a fast. So you see this concept that the Jewish people would fast before they went to war. Now, why were they fasting before they went to war? <clears throat> so I wanted to share the words, the expression of Al Chachamim. When Moshe Rabbeinu's hands went up and went down, the war would go up and down. Asks the Gemara. V'chiyadav shel Moshe osot milchama. Do the hands of Moshe do war? Right? Do they break war? Do they turn the tide? Because Moshe went like this, Moshe went like that. You know when I think of Moshe Rabbeinu on, by Amalek? You know when I think of Moshe? Every time I use a bottle opener for the wine, if you pull down the bottom, then, you know, <laughs> I think of Moshe. I, I always think of Moshe Rabbeinu and the war of Amalek. <laughs> Okay, I think maybe that's the hidden reason why uh, they made you drink wine on Purim so that you would use it again and again. <laughs> you remember Moshe Rabbeinu. <laughs> okay? Rabotai. <clears throat> so, I think the end of the Gemara is actually very instructive. The Gemara says, no, it doesn't mean that Moshe's hands won or lost the war. But rather, when he raised his hands and the Jewish people could see his hands raised to the heavens... Their hearts were inspired to teshuva, to prayer, to belief, to emunah in God. And when Am Yisrael together had that collective emunah, that faith, the prayer, then the, the, the tide of the battle turned. We as Jews know that it is not man that makes wars. Adonai ish milchama. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that runs wars. If you ever had to wonder about this concept, you could ask people that served in the Israeli army in 1948, 1967, and 1973, and ask them if they were the favorites at Ladbrokes, at Paddy Power, you know, at all the Ben and Las Vegas, who were the odds on? Were they on the five countries that were attacking the Jewish people simultaneously on multiple fronts with more soldiers and more weapons? They'll tell you that they saw Adonai Ish Milchama. They got to see that it is Borei Olam that decides a war. So the soldiers that would go into war, which is the most uh, violent and um, virulent expression of a human being's act of, acts of strength, lest the person think, that my strength did this miracle, what did they do to counteract that? They fasted before they went to war. So therefore, to commemorate this, we fast. Now most people think the reason why we're fasting now is to commemorate the fast of Esther. How do you know that that's not the case? Because when did, number one, three days. Okay, maybe we did the discount because we're much uh, schwacher like they say. The date is wrong. When did Esther fast? Over Pesach. Right? We know that Esther had to come. There had to be a special logic instituted. She uprooted a mitzvah from the Torah when she declared her fast. Okay? And if that's the case, my friends, right, we should have fasted then. The irony is that we do have a fast that coincides with her fast, which is the Ta'anit Bechorot. 
right? But that's not the fast of Esther. So it's clear that this is not that fast. And if that's the case, so we have to understand why we're fasting now. I get why we fast before you go into a war. To hammer into a soldier's head in the moment of the greatest act of human strength, an act of war, that this is not up to you. Okay? However, I think there's something else hidden here as well. Okay? Now I'm just going to share with you one or two other ideas before we come back to this concept and then maybe uh, take the lesson home in a powerful way. The, the, um, the, the Harambam wrote something very interesting. Excuse me, the Sefer Eshkol wrote something very interesting about this. He says that the reason why we're fasting today is because if we didn't institute fasting today, we were nervous maybe people would not come to hear the Megillah. They would be too busy eating and drinking. They wouldn't come to Megillah. I, I read this reason from the Sefer Eshkol, and I thought to myself, fine, I get it. I hear what you're saying. But where else do we have an example that we're so nervous that people won't do a mitzvah that we make them fast the whole day? Just so that they shouldn't be busy with anything else. I, I never saw, like for Chanukah, which is about Pirsum Enisa as well. Okay? You want to spread the, 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 idea, the concept of the nest. It doesn't say anywhere. You have to fast before Hanukkah so that you don't forget to light, the, the, light the, the, the candles you know, uh, um, so we made you fast. You don't find that. So I found that idea difficult to understand. Maybe I'm, I'm missing something. And I'm sure one of the great people out there that are listening can explain to me um, the concept of, uh, of the Sefer HaEshkol. However, there's one more reason before we come back to our basic premise that I want to share with you. And that is the reason of the Shulchan Aruch, who writes in the Sefer um, uh, Magid Mesharim, this is magnificent, all coming from the Hakdama of Yalkut Yosef in the, uh, in the, Sak, in the uh, Saka edition, excellent. And Maran writes, quoting in the Sefer Magid Mesharim, he says that he, it says that he used to learn, again, whatever this means, he was zochet to learn with an angel. That's why the book was called Magid Mesharim, that he was told this, these straight, these uh, concepts. So he used to learn with an angel. And whatever, what that means, whether it was an actual angel sitting learning with him, or whether he, the ideas that he came up with, they came from nowhere, so he related to that as if it was being given to him. But either way, he says that the reason why we fast, on, in uh, what's it called, uh, on the day before Purim, is because they were worried about what might happen through all the partying and drinking and uh, you know, and, fe- and feasting on the holiday, everyone's dressed up. The, the, the feeling is a feeling of kalut rosh, you know, of uh, lightheadedness. Everyone's a little too comfortable, a little too dr- drunk, a little too, a little too, a little too. They were worried about the terrible mistakes that could happen between people on that day, whether acts of violence, whether acts of uh, uh, in, in a pr- in a pr- inappropriate, of an inappropriate nature. So in order to make sure that people went in with the right headspace, they instituted a ta'anit before the day of Purim so that you'd come in with an element of, uh, of somber thought, uh, of, uh, of a more serious mindset, and that would offset perhaps what was going to happen later. I remember reading this a long time ago and thinking that what he meant was initially that you're fasting ahead of time to atone for the sins that you're going to do. <laughs> but you know what? There's no such thing. You can't put like teshuvah on credit. Like you can't decide, you know what, next week I'm going crazy, I'm going to go fly to wherever, I do all the crazy things, so I'm going to fast this week to get kapara in advance for, for late. It doesn't work. That's called echteh ve'ashuv, premeditated sin, cannot be, uh, cannot be, you can't do teshuvah, according to many opinions, even afterwards. Okay, last but not least, I want to come back to our original thought. Our original thought is there this, there's this idea, one more time, that they were fasting before they went to war. And because that fast was present before they went to war, so we're commemorating the fact that they fasted on that day. And I have a big problem with this. If we were commemorating the fact that they fasted before they went to war, then there's also a fast before the war against Amalek in the desert we didn't fast for and the fast of Yohanatan and the troops by the time before David, and the fast which literally would have been the fast before every war. There would probably be a fast on every single day of the calendar year. So why did they choose to isolate the fast 
before this war with the Ta'anit. So maybe you could say that they were combining the reasons, you know, the Sefer Eshkol's reason works together with this one, which works together with Rambam, and each one is playing with each other. Okay, I'm not going to get into saying yes or no on that. But what I do want to say is that there's something very special that happens in the story of Purim. Our rabbis tell us, um, when the Jewish people went to Har Sinai, HaKadosh Baruch Hu lifted a mountain above their heads, and he said to them, if you accept the Torah, good, v'imlav, sham te'ekvuratchem, this is where you'll be buried. Ask Tosafur, amongst many others, hold on. They said, nah, seven Ishma already. They said they were going to accept it. Why did God need to feel the need to force them? The Gemara continues, before we answer that question, the Gemara continues and says, Whoa, Amar Rava. Rava says, Mikan moda Rava leoraita. You see from here that you have a great get out clause, an answer when you get to Shamaim. Hashem is going to say, Why'd you do the sin? And you're going to say, Why'd you force me? You held the mountain over my head. Of course I said yes. I didn't really want to say yes. I had to say yes. So we have a great answer. Says the Gemara, Hadar kibluha biyeme achashverosh. They re-accepted the Torah at the time of Vachashverosh. And that, at that time, that re-acceptance was with our whole heart. It was with joy. Okay? And because of that, we're patur. Now, I have so many problems with this Gemara. Okay? Can I, the most obvious problem. What's the question? The question is, I didn't really want to accept it. I had to. There was a mountain over my head. No, 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 no. In Purim, they re-accepted it. Yeah, because there was Haman over my head. The same question you have in the question part of the Gemara, you have in the latter part of the Gemara. And the answer, my friends, is the Hadar Kibluha, the reacceptance that the Jewish people accepted, was not during the story of Haman, it was after the story of Haman. Like the Pasuk says, Ki emu kibelu ayyudim. In that Pasuk, we learn Kibelu, Ki emu kibelu. What do you mean? First you accept, then you keep. Answers the Gemara, Ki yemu, they held, uh, they upheld, Ma kibelu kevar. What did they accept it already? It was accepted not in the moment of fear and terror, it was accepted in the moment of joy. When you accept something from joy, it comes from a desire. It doesn't matter that Haman was on your head, that the mountain was on your head, if you accepted it later. But by the mountain, they were underneath the mountain when they said yes. Ask Stosafot, hold up a second. They already said Naasev and Ishma without a mountain over their head. They already accepted the Torah. Answers Tosafot, many different answers to this question. Tosafot answers, one is Torah Shiba'al Peh, one is Torah Shibichtav. Torah Shibichtav, the written Torah, the Bible, that God gave to Moshe, that God gave at Mar- Har Sinai, the Jewish people accepted. But did they accept the Chachamim's Takanot, the explanations, the interpretations? Did they accept that? No, they didn't accept that. Borei Olam knew that you can't have one without the other. Torah Shibichtav, without Torah Shibal Peh, is full of holes because it was designed to be that way. God says, do Shechita like I told you, and then doesn't write anywhere in the Torah how you do Shechita. He was relying on the corpus of law that was given to the Chachamim. So Rabotai, before we go into Purim, before we go into Purim, when we celebrate the fact that we were saved from Haman, that the wars went the way we wanted them to go, we celebrate a fast that the only way we know it exists is from dirashot and comparisons from the Chachamim. How do we even know that they fasted that day? It doesn't say in the Pasuk. The Chachamim explained they bring it from somewhere else. Where do we learn that from? We learn that from another place. So we're looking at the lessons that we learn, the Gezerot, the Takanot of the Chachamim, and we're, up, we're keeping up something which is the exact opposite of what we're going to do tomorrow. So tomorrow we're feasting. You know why tomorrow we're feasting? Because today we're fasting. Isn't that a beautiful understanding? So this day, this fast, the fast of war, this war, we want to call out, we want to commemorate, um, because the knowledge of it and the keeping of it 
is something that comes specifically as a, as a dirashot uh, um, from our chachamim, uh, comparisons, learnings, com- you know, etc., etc. My friends, I'd like to end with this thought, okay? One of the crazy things about human beings is that we listen to the stories and we uh, tell ourselves the stories that we like to hear. So as an example, if a person was trying to get married for a while, you know, they were with this girl and yes and no and it was very difficult. If they get married, how do they remember it? That was the dating period. Right? Oh, it was this and it was that. They tell the story, big smiles. They don't recall, they don't hold on to the heartbreak that they had during that time. She said, no, they're not sure. They want to know this. They want to know that. Right? They look at that as all part of the package of what it took to get married. So the end of the story is kovea, the way you're seeing all the details that lead up to it. There's terrible things in the Megillah. Horrible things. Things that are very difficult to see. But because at the end of that story, this was the result, so we almost overlook what, what almost happened. Rabbi Utai, you don't only learn and hear messages from God from end of story results. It's a really dangerous thing to do. The only time you learn a message is when you actually went bankrupt. Then the only way God could get you to hear a message is to actually make you bankrupt. The only way is if people actually die, if you actually get to, right? Then the only way to hear the message is if you actually die. What the Chachamim did over here by fasting before a war that almost went bad was they eliminated the necessity of the war going badly. So if we experienced an almost genocide, then that is a cause for tremendous fear and trembling and wondering what did we do wrong then that resulted in something that was so bad and perhaps are we repeating those steps today? Rabbi Tai, the almost carries within it as much or as many messages as what actually happens. Except the almost has, can have a fairy tale ending. This idea runs both ways. If something almost terrible happens to you, you have a responsibility. And I think, where do we learn that from? From the Biracha of HaGomel. The Biracha of Gomel says, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, right? HaGomel L'Chayavim Tovot, He who grants those that are not worthy, Tovot, good, de- good de- outcomes, Shigemalani Kol Tuv, Look, I was almost in this terrible accident. I flew across the ocean and nothing happened, etc., etc. I was in a makom, a place of sakana, and I escaped unscathed. And I recognize the almost. Rabbi Otay, Rabbi Yashiv used to ask, he held that you should not say, Shigemalani kol tub. Don't say, Shigemalani kol tub, that God granted someone who was undeserving only good. Rather, you should say, God granted Shigemalani Tob. He granted me good. Why? Revel Yashiv says, if he granted you Kol Tov, you wouldn't have got sick. If it was Kol Tov, right, it would not have been, you know, you would not have put in the Sakana of a, of a shipwreck. Aside from the questions we might have on Revel Yashiv's Psaq, I think that what we're looking at today, Lama say we don't hold that way. We, so we say, kol tub, right? And I think that perhaps that's exactly the point. The almost that I went through, that's the kol tub. Because really what was supposed to happen to me was something worse. God allowed me to get off with a nothing. You understand? They tell a story about, uh, about Napoleon. And Napoleon was once, he went to war, and as he went to war, he, the, the tide of the battle turned very quickly, and suddenly Napoleon found himself in an area where he was, um, where he was in, in terrible danger. The enemy soldiers were everywhere, they were looking for him to try and kill him. He goes to the house of, uh, he runs into one of the houses of, the, of somebody that's there, and he says, please hide me, I'm Napoleon. I need, they're searching for me in the streets. The guy felt bad, he liked the, the general. He hid him in underneath the, some, what's it called, some uh, like straw underneath the bed, pulled the bed back, 
The soldiers came in, they looked, they couldn't find him, they left. The guy comes to Napoleon afterwards, he pulls the bed out, takes off the straw, he comes out. Napoleon says, thank you so much. He says, you could ask me for anything and I'll grant you your wish. The man says to Napoleon, he says, you know, I, I wish I knew, I wish I knew how you felt under that bed. The most powerful man in the world, but all of a sudden with this sudden reversal of fortunes, you, you, know, you, you don't know if you're gonna live out the day. Napoleon's face contorts in anger. He says, you're making a mockery of me? I ask you, whatever you want, I'll give you. What, you want me to grovel to tell you how scared I was? Take this man away to the gallows. They bring this guy, they drag him, kicking and screaming. He says goodbye to his wife and his children. He's begging the whole way, Napoleon, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it. His face is stone, so upset. They take him up, they put the noose around his neck. They say the last, say your last words. He says his last words. And the executioner comes to kick the, the stool away. And Napoleon says, stop. He stops. Napoleon turns to the man. He says, that's how I felt. He, he promised to fulfill whatever the man asked of him. The man wanted to know what it felt like to feel that fear. Um, that, that's it. There's no more time. You run out. There's no more ways. You can't call someone you know. There's no vitamin P, protectia. You're going to get that one, this one, back, forth. Done. You're out. Chalas. Done. The Jewish people, before, before the story of Purim was over, they had no moves. You understand? If we thought five armies against us was a big deal, what happens when, when Achashverosh tells the world in 127 provinces, attack the Jews, take whatever they have, it's yours. Legal. He legalized, not weed like New Jersey, he legalized anti-Semitic genocide. They put up, it was amendment to the Persian constitution. It was a law signed with the seal of the king himself. They would have made quick work of the Jewish people, like Haman intended, that they should be wiped out in one day. Do you understand the fear of that? In the end, Baruch Hashem, the tide turns, like we said, and we get to fight back, and we get to live another day. But the fast that they felt, that when they plugged into that war, to recognize it once again that it was not their acts of bravery or their sword that won them the war, and it was not the heroics of Esther HaMalka that won her the war. And it was not Mordechai's diplomacy that won him the war. But rather, it was the teshuvah and the fasting and the prayers that achieved it. And in that way, perhaps it does also commemorate the ta'anit that Esther had before she walked into the throne. May we be zochet to hear the messages Hashem sends us. And may the almost speak as loudly in our ears as that which happens so that the messages don't need to come any closer. Thank you very much. Baruch Adonai Amen.